Welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series, now the world's largest weekly subscribed to and distributed leadership podcast. We're honored that you're joining us again. My name is Scott Miller, and I serve as your weekly host and interviewer. Today's guest is a revisit from one of our previous most popular listened to downloaded guests, Stephen M. R. Covey, who you know as the author of the New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling book, The Speed of Trust. He's the author of numerous other books, including Smart Trust, and he's here today from his studio, home studio, in Alpine, Utah, to talk about a new book that he's writing that's coming out in 2021. Stephen M. R. Covey, welcome back to On Leadership. Hey, thank you, Scott. It's great to be with you again. I'm excited. Stephen, great to see you. You're one of the few thought leaders at Franklin Covey who lives here in Utah, where we tape our program here and our headquarters, and although you offered to come into the studio live today, it would be great to see you. I haven't seen you during the pandemic. You and I met a week ago and had, I think, a cool idea, and that was uh, for you to join us today live, but virtually in your home studio, where you now are able to broadcast your keynote speeches, work with clients virtually, much like your father. Dr. Stephen R. Covey, of course, the author of the seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I heard that in your father's home in Provo. Of course, he's passed now for almost a decade. I heard he also had a bit of a satellite studio back when it was, you know, before its time. Uh, Talk a bit about what the inspiration was. I'm guessing some necessity, but talk about the transition from you leaving planes literally every day of the week, hopscotching around the globe, to now you being able to do a very similar kind of engagement with clients virtually from your home. Yeah, it's been, it's been a, quite a fun ride. Very interesting, because like you were saying, I, I, uh, I'd be on four, five, six, eight planes a week and uh, hopping all over the world and, and uh, certainly throughout the U.S. And... Now I'm 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 still doing the same work. I'm still working with clients. I'm still speaking at conferences. It's just all being done virtual. And and the thing about it is though, um, I'm home so much. My wife is waiting for the vaccine so she can get me back out on the road. <laughs> I think I think you described me. I think you described every spouse <laughs> that just uh, <laughs> wants that. Well, Stephen, we're delighted to have you coming to us from your home studio. You got a great crew there. You've got great lighting and tons of capability to change your background. All kinds of multi-camera angles for organizations, associations who are interested still in having you provide not just a keynote speech, but consulting, advisory capability. You can board, you can join executive teams, boards of directors. You can be formal, informal. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody knows that Stephen M. R. Covey is very much still uh, one of the most booked and engaged keynote speakers around the globe. He can just save you a few dollars on his airfare, right? <laughs> right now. That, that, that's right. And, and like you said, Scott, uh, my father had the vision for this way ahead of his time. Yes. And, and so we actually put this studio in before this pandemic and other things so that we would have this capa- capacity. And we started doing some things. But obviously, in the last little bit, it's just exploded as this become, has become the new way that we engage with our clients and present at conferences and even do executive team sessions yeah. through technology. And it's really yeah. quite exciting. It's a lot of fun, and it enables me to continue to do the, the work that I love to do. So the fact of the matter is you can teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I am that old dog. So I, I'm learning the new tricks. Uh, Stephen, we're delighted you've joined us. You've been on several times since the beginning of this series. We're well into the 100, I think, near 50th podcast episode, if not right there close. You were, I think, our very first interview. In fact, your interview remains the most watched, downloaded, rated, ranked interview in the entire series. We're honored you're joining us back again. Today you're here for a new topic because you have been working diligently, not just during the last say eight months, nine months in the uh, uh, virtual pandemic or the the virtual work environment. But prior to that, you spent the better part of the last year plus researching and writing a new book that is coming out in the fall of 2021, published, of course, by Simon & Schuster. I'm privileged to have a first early draft of the manuscript, the new book you've titled, at least tentatively, The New Way to Lead. The three stewardships to move from command and control to trust and inspire. Now, this book is still about a year out, so I think it's kind of cruel to tease the audience that the book is still coming out probably next 
October 2021, but you wanted to come on today at my invitation to talk about what's so exciting to you around the content of the book, because this is a leadership philosophy, a mindset that leaders can begin to start adjusting to now, not wait for the book. So first, tell us, why the new book? Here's why. Look at what's happening all around us in our world. The change, the disruption that's taking place. And I call these uh, four emerging forces of change. First, the world has changed with, uh, with disruption, with technology, you know, the, the type of change, disruptive technologies, the pace of change is just relentless. The amount of change is unprecedented. So the, all these changes taking place, and then so the world has changed, but also work has changed, both where and what. You know, the what of work has changed in that it's far more collaborative and creative and knowledge work. You know, the knowledge worker age, that idea. But the where has changed in that it's work from anywhere, work from home, work from anywhere, virtual teams, all this has changed. So the nature of work has changed. That's the second emerging force. The third emerging force is that the nature of the workforce has changed. We've got multiple generations like never before, as many as five. We have all these different expectations, hopes, dreams, desires, all this diversity that's come into our, into our teams, into our organizations like never before in unprecedented ways. So the workforce itself has changed. And then finally, the fourth emerging force is that the nature of choice has, has changed. We've gone from what we might say is multiple choice to infinite choice. The options, the possibilities, the opportunities are unreal today. And, and all these forces have kind of changed our whole world. I'll give you one little example of this. In 1900, but Mr. Fowler, the, the scientist, yeah. estimated that human knowledge doubled every century. In 1982, it was estimated by experts that human knowledge doubled every 13 months. Today, experts estimate that human, knowledge's, human knowledge doubles every 12 hours. Just the extraordinary explosion of data, information has just changed our world. And so with all these changes taking place, we can't continue to operate with a style of leadership that hasn't changed. You know, the world has changed, but our style of leadership has not. And we've got to change our style of leadership to be relevant for this new world that's going on all around us. Well, it's inspiring. I'm not sure my wife, Stephanie, thinks my knowledge is changing every 12 hours, but I will try to live up to that expectation. You mentioned these forces. How are they manifesting, impacting organizations right now? Lots of implications. But if I could just kind of narrow it down to two big ones, two jugular jobs to be done. I call these the epic imperatives of our time. And the first is the need for organizations to create great cultures that can attract and retain and engage and most importantly, inspire people so that we can win the war for talent and win in the workplace. And you've got to have a great culture that is a magnet to, to attract, retain, engage, and inspire people. People today don't want to just be motivated. They want to be inspired. They want to be part of something great and have meaning and purpose and contribu contribution. So to build that kind of culture is important. And it's especially important because people have so many choices and options of where they can go, including freelancing and the whole gig economy and other options. And so if we don't have a great culture, people will go find, find a place where they have a great culture. So that's the first imperative. We've got to build this kind of culture of inspiration. And the second epic imperative of our time is that we need to collaborate and innovate so that we can stay relevant in this changing world where everything is changing so rapidly. We've got to stay relevant. And we can't do that if we're not innovating. And this way, in this sense, we've got to win in the marketplace. And, and that's all about innovation. And we've got to innovate today. And if we don't, we'll become irrelevant in a changing, shifting, dynamic, disruptive world. 
So those are the two imperatives. Build a great culture that inspires people so that we win in the workplace and innovate and collaborate and innovate to stay relevant so that we win in the marketplace. Inspiration and innovation. That's what's in front of us. And, and, and that's why we need a new way of leading in order to drive that kind of inspiration and innovation. Otherwise, it won't happen. So Stephen, I mean, the premise of the book is that leaders, if they want to accomplish what you just talked about in terms of a great culture, we have to move away from a command and control style of leadership. And that seems like a duh. But the fact of the matter is, you know, all of my generation, I'm 50 plus, have relied on command and control generally as our default leadership style. It's how our parents typically led. It's how our bosses led. I'm sure the team that I lead sees a lot of that in me. You know, my technique and my intent don't always match. It's a theme that you and your father have popularized for decades. How do leaders like me, who their default style, not because we're bad people, not because we're, you know, narcissist or we're sociopaths, but it's worked for us some of the time. H how do we break that cycle of command and control? Yeah, it's, 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 it's the, the challenge and the opportunity for most of us because we're estimating that, you know, probably 90% of people still operate kind of with the old style, the command and control. Not that they're bad people, they're not. They're not. It's just that the world has changed, but our style of leadership is not. And it's becoming less and less relevant. So we've got to shift and go to a new style of leadership. And that's going to cause us to do that. We have to shift our paradigm, change our paradigm, broaden it of a new paradigm of leadership and of people. So let me describe it in just a moment, this new paradigm of how we see people. But I will say this, that what's happened, Scott, is that we've become better in our old style. You know, it's a better form of command and control today. It's more sophisticated. Yeah. It's, it's even more enlightened. We brought kindness to it, benevolence to it, and we brought emotional intelligence to it. We've even brought mission to it and, you know, trustworthiness, all these good things. It's just that the dominant paradigm yeah. is still based upon kind of an outdated way of seeing people and of leadership that used to work in the industrial age but no longer works in this di digital age, knowledge worker age, whatever we might call it, where all these forces are upon us and we have these two new imperatives of, of uh, inspiration and innovation and you can't command and control your way to greater innovation. You know, you've got to go to a new style of leadership. I call it trust and inspire. So here is, let me just sh share a few of the fundamental beliefs that are part of the collective paradigm of this new way of leading, trust and inspire, as in, you know, in contrast, in juxtaposition to command and control, the authoritarian style. Here's a new way based upon influence, trust and inspire. So the old, you know, the old paradigm that maybe served us in a different time doesn't serve us today. So the new paradigm, here's some of the beliefs. Um, I believe greatness is inside of people. So my job as a leader is to unleash them, not control them. I believe people are whole people, body, heart, mind, spirit. So my job as a leader is to inspire, not merely motivate. I believe there is enough for everyone. So my job as a leader is to elevate caring above competing. Leadership is stewardship. So my job as a leader is to put service above self-interest. And I believe that enduring influence is created from the inside out. So my job as a leader is to go first. Scott, those fundamental beliefs comprise a new paradigm of people and of leadership that is needed today, that we need to adopt in, at the paradigm level in order then to adapt our style. We've got to cross the chasm, if you will, from command and control to trust and inspire based upon these fundamental beliefs. Because how you see people and how you see leadership makes all the difference in the world. And as we do that, as we shift the paradigm, then we can also catch up with the behavior and how we go about leading. But it starts with the paradigm. 
if I had a wastebasket, I'd put it on my head right now because I feel like it's a little bit of a leadership intervention. So you're saying my style's not working, huh, Stephen? <laughs> let, let me ask you this question. You used the word inspire a lot in the last, you know, 10 minutes or so. When I think of, insp- when I think of inspire, a leader that inspires, I think of loud and, and charismatic and contagious and high energy. Is that what you mean? Not necessarily at all. In fact, I would say no. Um, it's, it's one of the key learnings in our work on this and our research is that um, you don't have to be charismatic to inspire. Think about it. I'll bet all of us know people who are charismatic but who aren't inspiring. And I'm very confident we also know people who you wouldn't describe as charismatic who are inspiring. So if you just think about it, here's the premise. Do, you know, the inspire comes from the Latin word ins, ins, inspirare. I don't know how to speak the Latin, <laughs> but it means to breathe into. So you're breathing life into that which was lifeless. And I believe that the life is already inside of people. It just maybe has gone out. So you're trying to reignite it to, to, to uh, catch spark and the flames that are already there inside of people. Whereas, you know, mere motivation, I want to distinguish between motivation and inspiration. Motivation is extrinsic. It's, it's external. It's outside of people. So you're trying to provide carrot and sticks, you know, either rewards or pain to try to motivate people. And as Daniel Pink says, yeah, motivation works. What it does is it motivates people to get more rewards. So they try to you know, just, you know, perpetuate this external extrinsic process. Whereas inspiration is intrinsic, it's inside of people. And the whole idea is that everyone can inspire. You can learn how to inspire. Inspiring is a learnable skill, not just for the charismatic. So the best illustration of this is if you take uh, uh, Jim Collins in his great work, uh, Good to Great, and he talks about a level five leader. And he says they have that paradoxical, paradoxical combination of deep personal humility and intense professional will. My words for it are humility and courage. And that inspires people. And they may not be charismatic as all, at all, but the humility inspires people. And, and, um, and so my whole premise is everyone can inspire. It is a learnable skill. It's not just for the charismatic. And that is what's needed today, not motivation. We need inspiration. It's where, you know, to use the, the Wayne Gretzky metaphor of, I, you know, what makes you such a great hockey player? Yeah. And he said, I skate to where the puck is going to be. I'm telling you, inspiration and inspirational leadership is where the puck is going to be. And we need to be there. We need to learn how to do this as leaders, as teams, as organizations, because it's, it's really inspiring people is the new competitive advantage in our world today. It's a huge opportunity. Stephen, I've read the manuscript. Uh, uh, not to be cliche-ish, but it's inspiring. You talk a lot about the role that modeling plays in credibility and in being an inspiring leader. Uh, riff a few minutes on the necessity that modeling plays for this new role of a leader? It, it all starts there. It's very rare, if at all, even, if even possible, to sustain inspiration, to be inspiring to others. If you yourself don't model the behavior, if you yourself aren't inspired. So modeling is all about finding your why, your source of inspiration, but it's also modeling the kind of behavior that is needed today. I already mentioned the idea is the, the, the behavioral virtues of humility and courage. And, and, um, and it's kind of a paradoxical combination, but they're both vital. In fact, data from LRN shows that leaders that demonstrate and show humility inspire people 18 times more than those that don't. In other words, are you walking it? Are you, are you authentic? Are you leading out? That inspires people when they see that you're real, you're genuine, you're authentic. You model it. You go first. You're humble and courageous at the same time. You're authentic and vulnerable. You're empathetic. You have empathy as well as 
you model performance and delivery and getting the job done. And, and then when people see a model, that inspires them. And we all can start with ourselves and be that model. So it starts with modeling as, as, as where you begin. And everyone can do that. But it then moves to trusting. We've got to also be willing to trust people. This is the in trust and inspire. This is the trust. It's not enough to be trustworthy. We have to be trusting of our people. And, and I've seen lots of trustworthy people working together with no trust between them because neither person is willing to extend trust to the other. So as leaders, we need to be trusting. And when you trust other people, that also inspires them. In fact, I'll put it this way. To be trusted is the most inspiring form of human motivation. It brings out the very best in all of us. So modeling and trusting are kind of the starting point for inspiring. Now there's more to it that we, I hope we can talk about, but you start with modeling and then you expand to trusting. And when you do that, you're on third base now. Well, let's keep going, keep building on that because you've already established that in order to inspire, you don't have to have a big, loud, large personality. You don't have to be thought of or feel like you are a, an especially contagiously charismatic person, right? Jim Collins established that and you're proving that. We hear a lot right now about virtual leadership needing to build engagement to create connection between people. I'm assuming that this role of being inspirational, of inspiring people, has a direct connection between a leader and her team, virtually live in person. How is the outcome building perhaps connection with people? Wonderful. Um, in fact, let me build upon what you just said, Scott. You talked about engagement and what that does and, and, and how you, know, you connect with people, you'll engage them, you will. But there's another level beyond engagement and that is inspiration. I believe that inspiration is the new engagement. I think it's the next level, it's beyond. And there's data from Bain and Company that shows the productivity of inspired people is 56% higher than engaged people. So we've been you know, striving for engagement, which is a great thing, and I don't, not, I'm not downplaying it. But there's another level, inspiration, that's even better. And, and so we're, we're striving for that, and you're absolutely right. So I'm saying, look, if you start with modeling, that inspires people. You add to it trusting, trusting them, that inspires them, that puts you on third base. Here's what brings you home, and you said it, it is connecting. It is connecting with people and connecting to purpose. So let me just briefly just mention the connecting with people. And, um, and then maybe after we'll do another question and, and I'll tie into the connecting to purpose. But on the connecting with people, and that's really about first you connect with yourself. Find your why. What's your why? What matters to you? What's important to you? What's your purpose? Meaning contribution so that you can then give it to others. I love uh, how Pablo Picasso said that the purpose of your life is to find your gift. The meaning of your life is to give it away. So you gotta find what's your why. You gotta become inspired yourself. So you start with yourself, but then you build it in your relationships. You connect with people one on one. As you write about, Scott, in, in your book on the six critical practices, one on one and these connections. And the key principle here is you demonstrate caring and that you care, that you care about your people. You care about each person individually and you care about them as a person, but you also care about them finding their why, their sense of meaning, purpose, and contribution what, of what matters to them. And rather than you just dictating that what matters to you and to the company should matter to them, no, your whole approach is I care about you. What matters to you? What's your opinion? And then finally, you move to the team level, and it could be the organizational, if that's your whole, if you're the leader of the whole organization, but the team level is all about a sense of belonging, where I have a sense of connection. I'm part of this. This is part of my team, my tribe. I belong to this. That inspires people. Caring inspires people. Seeing a model inspires people. So all these things can inspire. So I'll give you one little illustration of this in action. Indra Nui, who just retired as the former chairman and CEO of PepsiCo, one of the great leaders I've ever known, I had a chance to meet with her in her office, spend some time with her, and she told me the story of how 
when uh, she had gone back to India to visit her, her mother. Her father had passed away. And all these, uh, you know, her mother had a lot, a lot of neighbors and friends and people that came over to, to greet Indra as well. And, and here Indra was now the CEO of PepsiCo, you know, this prominent role. And Indra said, she was amazed at how the people that came to, to visit with them didn't compliment Indra like, oh, you're doing so well. Instead, they complimented Indra's mother <laughs> and said, wow, what a daughter you have raised, what you have done, and just, you know, just complimented. She was so struck by that, that when she came back, mm. she said, you know what? I look, at, I look at my executive team, she said, I think it's important that not only do they know how much I think of them, I think it's important that their parents know how much I think of them. So she wrote personal notes to the parents of each and every member of her executive team saying, telling them um, what an amazing son or daughter that they have raised, how grateful she is that they have done that and what a contribution they're making and, and praise them up and down of how valuable they were in producing such a child. And that demonstration of care, not just to the executive, but to their parents showed such a level of authenticity and caring. It just builds enormous trust, but it inspires people. And so my point is everyone can inspire because you can connect with people and you can demonstrate caring and create a sense of belonging. And that's where you start and everyone can do it. Stephen, uh, a corollary is a, sh a story I share frequently is when I used to work in the education division 25 years ago at Franklin Covey. I was a salesperson and you were the president of the firm at the time. I remember that every quarter you, and you'll deny this or you'll, you'll you know, show excessive humility, you wrote a personalized note to everyone that had met or exceeded their quarter. And I remember your assistant, I think her name was Cindy at the time, maybe I have that wrong, would uh, then give us these notes. And, and they, were, they were letters, but you would, you would generally write a note on it. Scott, congratulations, 106%. So appreciate all you're doing. And, and they would be personalized every month. This art is somewhat lost. This, this level of connection seems to get lost in the busyness, in the efficiency of leadership. How do we pull ourselves back to that? It's a great question. We, we, we pull ourselves back by recognizing that what is going to not just engage people, but inspire them, move them to a different level, help them find the drive, is that connection with people, the caring, the empathy, the compassion, the understanding, and it's personal, it's one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, no, I tried to do that. I, I often failed and, did, and, fell, and fell short, but that type of caring and connection is genuine and real. That can be powerful. You know who did this really well? Was Doug Conant, the former president and CEO, uh, chairman and CEO of Campbell Soup Company. And he took him from kind of lowest engagement to highest engagement. And, and also at the same time, you know, low performance to high performance, you know, extraordinary transformation. He personally wrote 30,000 handwritten notes to people that were not generic. They were, they were very specific around reasons why he valued them, gratitude for their contributions, very specific. He demonstrated such caring, it inspired people. But he, it, you know, he didn't start with that, he started with the modeling, and then he trusted. And then when you add to it a connecting with people through caring, genuine interest, and demonstrating that in the little things, it really makes a difference. And so I think the best way we'll get back to it is to recognize we need to lead in a different way today. And the idea of efficiency is not near as important as effectiveness. And with people, fast is slow and slow is fast. And it takes time to write that, you know, note, note by note, one by one. But you do that, you go slow. Ultimately, in the long game, we're all playing the long game, you can go fast, exceptionally fast, because you build trust, you build the relationship, and you create inspiration. And so you know, we, that's how we'll come back to it, is recognize that these are principles. And the principle here is caring and caring and connection that will lead to inspiration. 
Uh, hold up, I'm just texting my parents' um, physical mailing address, okay, so you can send them a note for me. <laughs> They'll be stunned that I'm even employed. <laughs> well done, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, you, you mentioned earlier this word purpose, which we hear a lot, not just with the new generation coming into the workforce, right, that is focused on contribution and purpose and mission. Uh, connect back the role that inspiration and leadership plays to purpose. Yes, this is, is, is vital. So inspiring, again, I'm going to kind of say you inspire when you model, you inspire when you trust, and you inspire when you connect with people, which is what I just talked about, and when you connect to purpose. People do have a longing for meaning, for purpose, for contribution in their lives, for significance. They want to matter. And they want their jobs to matter. They want the work they do to matter. And like you said, it's not just the younger generations. You know, millennials are often referred to as the purpose generation. But there's strong data that shows it's not just millennials. It's, it's the upcoming generation, the, the centennials, but it's also the Gen Z, um, you know, Gen y, the Gen Y. Yep. Um, even baby boomers and traditionalists have a desire for significance and to matter, to make a difference. And so the whole premise here is now connect, not just with people, connect to purpose and connect people to purpose. So this is bringing significance into the job to be done. But I think, Scott, what's critical here, you is this, you earn, you earn the right to do that. What earns you the right is by first connecting with them as a human being, as a whole person, that caring. Then, when you, then after having done that, when you connect them to purpose, they believe you because they know you care about them. When you just skip that step and they don't feel like you care and you say, hey, here's the purpose of what we're trying to do, they're a little skeptical, a little cynical about it if you haven't first connected with them. So connect with them first earns you the right to connect to purpose. And that's meaning, contribution, trying to show that you can add value in your job and in your work and make a contribution in the world. And the premise here is that we can get good at this as at leaders. We can find the ways to both create and embed purpose, meaning, and contribution into any role and into any organization. Now look, if I'm working for St. Jude Children's uh, Research Hospital. <laughs> it's pretty easy, right? To find purpose there, because I'm curing cancer for kids. That's pretty easy. What if I'm a janitor at an organization? You know, how do I, where's the purpose there? And I'm reminded of the great um, uh, event that happened uh, in, I think it was in early 60s after John F. Kennedy said, we're gonna get a man to the moon yeah, and back right. by the end of the decade. And then he was visiting at a site in NASA and he comes across the janitor and says, so what do you do, the janitor? And the janitor says, I'm putting a man on the moon. That's what I do. I'm working to put a man on the moon. And see, they had, they had connected and embedded the meaning, the purpose, the contribution of what they were trying to do to the entire organization, to every level, to the janitor. And that's the whole idea, is that each of us as a leader can get really good at creating and connecting and embedding purpose, meaning, and contribution to any role in almost any organization. Some are easier than others, some are more natural, but you can find ways to do it. You know, Starbucks, you know, you're serving coffee, right? but their whole mission and vision is to inspire and nurture the human spirit. You know, Harley Davidson makes motorcycles, but their mission is, you know, we fulfill dreams of personal you know, fulfillment. A person, we fulfill personal dreams. Hmm. And, you know, these types of things. And the point is, you can create um, meaning and purpose and contribution, and then you can connect to it. You can overlap purpose between the organization and the individual. And we need this today. We need to be inspired and having purpose will inspire. But I think too often we jump to that and skip the connecting with people first. We've got to do both. Stephen, your credibility is self-evident. Your first book, The Speed of Trust, sold over two million copies. Franklin Covey's Speed of Trust offering inside of our All Access Pass, which is, of course, a enterprise license that covers all of our content, is one of the best implemented leadership solutions worldwide. I bet 
we're torturing some people, given that uh, your book's not coming out for another 10 months. Send us off with some very tangible things that each of us as leaders, formal or informal, can start doing now before the new book comes out in the fall of 2021 to start to move into this paradigm of away from control and command more towards inspire and trust. Yeah, okay, I would say this. I focused heavily on inspiration because that's kind of a whole new, whole new field. And there's a whole new dimension of where the puck is going. But I wanna come back to where the puck is right now and what's happening. And that is to the trust in the trust and inspire, you know, paradigm of leadership and the new way to lead instead of command and control, trust and inspire. So I talked about inspire. Let me come back and talk about trust. And I'll give you a practical, tangible thing that every one of our, of our viewers and listeners can do today. And that is this. Um, you look in the mirror, you start with yourself. And it's not just, do I trust myself? Do I give to my team leader they can trust? Yes, start there. That's your modeling. But find the ways to lead out and extend trust to others, to your people, um, to, you do, to be more trusting. And I find in the work I'm doing on trust right now, when I go back to a client for the second, third, fourth, fifth time, which I've done many times in different situations, I find that almost all my work shifts from a focus on trustworthiness, you know, credibility, you know, the four cores of credibility, the first 12 behaviors, for those that are familiar with the speed of trust, that's becoming more trustworthy. It almost always goes to that 13th behavior, extend trust, to becoming more trusting and, and to be willing to extend that trust, have a bias, a mindset to want to trust people. Now, look, I'm saying, you know, I'm not saying blindly trust people. Be smart about it always with clear expectations and accountability built in as part of the trust being extended, always with good judgment to assess the situation, the risk, but we gotta become more trusting. And so find ways of saying, who can I trust? Who can I extend trust to? And I would just ask each of us to say, think back on your own life. Who trusted you? Who believed in you? Who had confidence in you? Who maybe believed in you more than you did yourself? My guess is each of us have had someone that has done that for us. My father did it for me, as well as John Walsh. I write about that in my books. But, but who trusted you? I ask each of us. And what that did to you. And, and then my corollary is, for whom can you be that kind of person? Yeah. Can you trust somebody else and extend that trust to them to be trusting? That's a great starting point. And that's all part of trust and inspire. You trust people and you inspire them to make a contribution, to make a difference, to matter. Stephen, you easily could have authored this book on your own, but you chose to invite two of your long-term colleagues, David Kasperson and Gary Judd, to join you. Talk about the decision to have those two colleagues join you in developing the manuscript. Number one, they're both trust and inspire leaders. Number two, they are extraordinary collaborators with me. And this process, you mentioned a year, it's actually been four years I've been working on this book. Yeah. And, and, um, and so they're my ongoing collaborators of kind of developing the ideas, checking the ideas, testing them, and, and helping on the writing, doing these types of things to make this real, to connect with people and, and to really resonate. And they're both extraordinary contributors. And, and so I, I wanted to be authentic and transparent and to recognize and acknowledge that they're vital to this work and to this, this new way of leading. You know, the world has changed. Our way of leading has not. We need a new way of leading that's relevant for our times. And this is it. And they, they are enormous uh, contributors uh, to me and to this work. And that's why I wanted to recognize and acknowledge that contribution. Your father, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, would be and is proud of you. Stephen M. R. Covey, the authors of numerous books, including The Speed of Trust, Smart Trust, and the book coming out in the fall, the frustratingly late book, not late, but coming out in the fall of 2021, The New Way to Lead, The Three Stewardships to Move from Command and Control to Inspire Trust by Stephen M. R. Covey with David Kasperson and Gary Judd. Stephen, thank you for joining us again. We are delighted that you were able to demonstrate some of your virtual technology. If anybody is interested in engaging with 
Stephen in a virtual or at some point, hopefully again, live keynote. He has all that capability. You can visit franklincovey.com or even contact Franklin Covey Speakers Bureau and we can make that happen for you. Stephen, thank you again for your time. Say hi to your co-authors as well. I certainly will. Thank you so much. And I'll leave you with the great expression my father would always say, life is about contribution, not accumulation. Hmm. This is what Trust and Inspire is all about. Tell my wife that when she's headed to Nordstrom this afternoon. <laughs> my Great wife adores you. Thank Scott, you, Stephen. Great to be with all our viewers and listeners. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of On Leadership. If you're not subscribing, please do so by visiting franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership tab. This comes out every week on Tuesdays, Tuesday morning via email. It also includes a downloadable tool from Franklin Covey's archive, and I write a blog about the interview each week. You also can consume it on all of your favorite podcast platforms, and we'll see you with a new guest next week here for On Leadership. <music> <laughs>